We're studying the book of Daniel in search of the larger faith that is revealed throughout this book. When the Lord exiled his people from their land and therefore from their religion, Daniel lost all of his dreams that a young person would have. And he determined to trust God to give him a better life than the one he lost. He looked for the story of his life to be written in God's larger story of redemption. Daniel immediately took steps to remind himself daily that he was not, never would be, defined by his king. Uh, he'd become the best uh, servant his king ever had, but he would and ever would, ever and ever would uh, belong to his God. And that resolve, however, was challenged right away. Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. The king of Babylon had a nightmare, a dream so troubling he couldn't get back to sleep. He couldn't get it out of his mind. It's really tempting to go into the dream, uh, but we don't have time to do it all today. We're going to study the dream next week. For now, suffice to say, it threatened him personally uh, more than his life. It threatened his whole legacy and why he was there. So he called in his elite group of priest scholars. Uh, one uh, uh, student, uh, contemporary student, describes them as, quote, the political consultants, trend spotters, and religious gurus of the day. They represented a variety of disciplines, all dedicated to the study of the forces that drive human existence. Now today, when you, when you talk about the study of universal forces, you call it physics. They wanted to understand how those forces shaped our lives, and that's called metaphysics. They were the Babylonian equivalent of a think tank dealing with both science and religion at the same time. They originated uh, largely through a, a thinker named Zoroaster, uh, who believed in one God, and he looked for connections between God and this world. Divine wisdom was their stock and trade. Hence, they were collectively known as the wise men, uh, or magi. Uh, yeah, the same group that centuries later would visit the newborn Jesus. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Uh, tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Now, this was common for magi. It's what they did. They interpreted dreams. They understood that just observing facts in nature didn't give any meaning to our lives. They claimed that such meaning was made clear in our dreams. And so as the official wise men of society, uh, they got to define the meaning of life uh, partly by interpreting dreams. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you should be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. Giving Magi the authority to define life's meaning was fine. It was a fine system for shaping society. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't thinking that day in terms of a social architect. He was one human being who was desperate that his legacy was in danger. And on that day, the king wasn't looking for social convention. He was looking for truth. He was looking for divine truth. These men claimed to give divine truth. And his secret fears surfaced that when the Magi interpreted dreams, they were just making it all up. So this time, he didn't just ask them to reveal the interpretation of his dream. He told them to reveal the dream itself. He wouldn't tell them what it was. You tell me what it is. They answered a second time and said, uh, let the king... I put the uh in there because I think that's probably how they felt. But. <laughs> Let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty you're trying to gain time. 
because you see that the word is, from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the times change, until it changed my mind. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I'll, sh and I'll know that you can show me its interpretation. The king wants a true interpretation. He wants real divine truth. And uh, if the Magi can tell him what the dream was, then he'll have confidence that they can interpret it. The Chaldeans answered the king and said... There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing the king asks is difficult. No one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. I mean, we deal with divine truth. What you want is divine truth. <laughs> Oops. God doesn't live with us. We can't just ask him. What do you expect? Well, because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, this is something of a tragic overreaction. I mean, the Magi are the repository for Babylonian knowledge. Uh, their wholesale destruction would be catastrophic for the empire. But the priestly incompetence of these scholar priests had been exposed. And as the junior members of that group, the extinction would now apply to Daniel and his friends. Then Daniel uh, replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? And then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Like the rest, Daniel had no idea what the king's dream was. But unlike them, he knew somebody who did. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Meshiel, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He answered and said, and, and before I, we see what he said, this is, this is the difference, isn't it, between Daniel and the Magi. The Magi only dealt with each other. If they had come up with an answer, they would have congratulated each other, published a paper or something. Uh, Daniel thanks God. Uh, and what he says is, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and insight. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings. He sets kings up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. These are beautiful prayers. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Daniel and his friends did not use their superior knowledge and training, uh, which we were told earlier that they had, uh, to deduce the king's dream. They were servants of the Lord God who had chosen to reveal himself to all the world through Israel. And they asked God to tell them, and he did. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show, him the, king, show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. We have to save that last phrase for next week. Because what was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar is amazing. But right now we're just looking at this one idea that there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. The Babylonians were among the very first to systematically study our world, our universe in an attempt to extract meaning for our lives. What we call chemistry, they called alchemy, which was the earliest attempts at chemistry, trying to figure out the building blocks of matter. We have now a periodic table, 
but they began much simpler with earth, air, fire, and water. And eventually those four elements weren't enough to explain things, and slowly what we call chemistry evolved. What we call astronomy, they called astrology. This, they systematically observed correlations between the stars and planets and what happened on Earth, like most especially the seasons. And they speculated about cause and effect. And in doing so, they accumulated a huge bank of astronomical data along the way that became the basis for what we call astronomy. The Babylonian wise men were the first to speak the language of science, which is mathematics. They created the most important number of all. You know what it is? Yes, they created the zero. Uh, Egyptians didn't have that, and that meant that the Babylonians could do complex calculations because they had a placeholder. They developed a numerical system based on 60, uh, 15 knuckles and four fingers is how it worked, 60, and uh, we still use that system in our counting of hours and minutes, both of time and of degrees. Um, they didn't know algebra, but they got very, very close to square roots, quadratic equations, and they even seemed to understand the gist of Pythagoras' theorem before the Greeks even invented theorems. It's fashionable to dismiss the Magi these days as pre-scientific fools. What a mistake. In fact, they were among the first to systematically use observation and logic to describe reality. Yesterday's science always seems foolish today, it wasn't so long ago that doctors used to bleed people for all kinds of illnesses. Now I bet there are people in this room who still think of atoms as uh, in the Rutherford model with a, a, a nucleus and electrons are spinning around like uh, planets. And uh, quantum theory has put that away. By our standards, the wise men were primitive. But we should think of Daniel and the other magi in their own day as we would think of NASA or MIT or CERN or or any number of uh, other collection of geniuses. Babylonian kings relied on them to become what scholars today call the first superpower. The crisis of our text was that because of personal trauma, Nebuchadnezzar dared to ask NASA and MIT a question they could not answer. Essentially, why? What does my life and my legacy mean? Why am I here? What's going on? Wise men tell you what. They can only pretend to explain why. But in fact, they can only speculate. They know no more of God's mind than anyone else. And when they pretend to know more, they can get caught because it's smoke and mirrors. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery what the, that the king has asked. The wise men of any society often act as scholar priests. And over time, as scholars with lots and lots of hard work and just, just uh, explosions of brilliance, wise men discover a great deal. They're able to describe the universe with models that use more and more data and more and more data and better models. And they're these great scholars. But wise men have always made lousy priests. Observing creation tells us more and more of what God did, but not why he did it. You could examine all the facts of my life. You could you know, weigh me, measure me, whatever. You still wouldn't understand why I make the decisions I make. That's something I have to tell you. For who knows the, uh, a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. In order to know questions of purpose, it's not enough to know what God has made. We have to know God himself and hear from him why he made it. But as the Magi observed, we can't ask God for answers. He doesn't live with us. We are estranged from him. Therefore, the only way to get answers of purpose for real is for God himself to reveal them to us and come to live with us again. The mysteries of life have not changed in millennia. Never better captured than in a, in a little inscription on the upper left of a famous painting by Gauguin in 1897 in Tahiti. And there's up, up there in the upper, upper left, it says, where did we come from? What are we? And where are we going? These are questions everyone asks and no one can naturally answer. Questions of purpose can never be answered by the thing needing purpose. 
a smartphone cannot create its own intended purpose. That, meaning, it, the meaning is a function of, of design. Only a smartphone's creator can tell you why it was designed the way it was. And what's true is for a smartphone is true for a rock or a nebula or a tree or a giraffe or a human being. Meaning is a function of design. Design is more than a description of what you see. Design has to do with intended purpose. A thing may be improperly used, but everything that is made has an intended purpose, which can only be defined by the designer. Mankind has always, since our beginning, tried to take the place of God and define the meaning of all things. Well, that works pretty well for the things that we design, like screws and coffee pods and things, but what about things we haven't designed, like us? The dream of meaning is a dream we all have built in. And every society looks to its own wise men to interpret this dream. And they never seem to be at a loss. Magi, psychologists, biologists, astrophysicists, they all suggest answers. Wise men are often not content to simply be scholars and often assume the role of scholar priests who alone have the divine wisdom to interpret our dreams of meaning. And our wise men's answers at any civilization seem just fine until something causes us to need a real answer. We all play the game. We all know that our wise men are just guessing about where we came from and what we are and where we're going. But what happens when a guess just isn't good enough? When you suffer a nightmare that all you are and do and accomplish will all turn to dust when your heart absolutely insists that you are in fact significant, but you have no idea why. The only one who can explain why we were made is the one who made us, and that is God. And the Magi were right. We're not on speaking terms with him. So the most important message of the world is one that God himself sends through historical revelation captured in the Bible, culminating in Jesus Christ, God in the flesh once again dwelling with us. Questions of what and why are different questions. But they do not have to be at war because we need both. One requires observation. The other requires revelation if we're to have it. It absolutely pains my heart to see the ongoing war between contemporary science and biblical Christianity. What should be a marriage made in heaven has turned to an angry, selfish divorce. And there's fault on both sides. Angry things have been said in both directions. Modern science developed in a culture saturated with Christian thought. My point is not that other religions can't be scientific. I mean, look at the Magi. My point is that Christianity and science ought to work together particularly well. Both assume a universe that is consistent, rational, and worth understanding. Understanding both the what and the why. Well, you may ask, well, what happens when they don't agree? Married couples often disagree. That is no reason for a divorce. When you disagree, you exercise patience. You exercise mutual respect while you search for a solution. And in the meantime, you emphasize the shared principles and convictions that tie you together. And keep two things in mind in particular. First of all, science is going to develop. Science is going to change. Not because there's anything wrong with it. That's simply how it works. Developing better models is what science is all about. More data comes in. Old ideas of understanding have to be thrown aside. New things created. That's wonderful. It's the way it works. Uh, today's astrophysicists will tell you that 27% uh, of the universe is made up of dark matter. The universe is filled with dark energy. And you ask any of them, what is that? And they'll say, I have no idea. I mean, the words, those words that they use are simply a way of saying that what is out of whack when you compare observations with theories. And so they give it a name. Now, we don't criticize scientists for critiquing their own theories. They're doing a good job. We don't call them magicians because they believe that unknown forces govern our lives, which, of course, they do. They're just doing their job, and they're doing it well, letting data drive their ever-changing and improving theories. I don't know what it's going to look like in 100 years. 
from a scientific perspective, perceived problems with the Bible may not be a problem 20 years from now. That may be hard to imagine, but there was a time when it was hard to imagine that there was anything more than earth, air, fire, and water. And the second thing to keep in mind is the Bible must be interpreted on its own terms. For centuries, the church objected to the theory that the earth revolves around the sun because the Bible says the earth cannot be moved. I don't think there's a Bible interpreter today who doesn't regret that application of Scripture. The psalmist was talking about permanence and stability, not astronomy. Some contemporary conflicts between science and religion will be clarified as we learn to better interpret the word that God gave us. We need a faith that is larger than human wisdom. That does not mean that faith has to be irrational. Science can be irrational if you want. It becomes magic. Faith can be irrational if you want. That becomes magic too. It doesn't have to work that way. There is absolutely nothing irrational about listening to Almighty God when He tells us why He made us. Science cannot hear God's voice. It isn't even listening. Science examines what God has done, what He's made. It's their job. It does not cannot perceive God's intent. The fact that we cannot hear God's voice is not a scientific problem as if we lost the frequency. It's a relational problem. God and the human race are not on speaking terms. The wise men were right about that. The God's dwelling is not with flesh. We don't know God's mind. Our Creator no longer lives with us. And the Bible will tell us that it wasn't Him who abandoned us, but us who abandoned Him. But Daniel demonstrated to a king who was hungry for meaning that there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Since our spirits are deaf to him, he wrote this message down. Since we couldn't hear it, he wrote it down, carving it in the history of a nation vindicated by miracles of plenty and capped with his own personal arrival in Jesus Christ. The book of Daniel is all about Jesus Christ. He didn't know what his name would be, but he knew who he was. In what we call redemptive history, God is speaking to this world. And perhaps the only thing that is keeping us from hearing him are our own dreams, dreams that we obsess over, things that we say our lives just have to be. Things have to be this way. I have to have this. My happiness depends on that. And I don't care about anything else. I've got to have my dreams. Such dreams become nightmares when we realize that we're not going to have them. But you know something? It's when dreams become nightmares that we have the best chance of waking up. Nebuchadnezzar became desperate for God's word because he saw his dreams for himself sleeping, slipping away. He was so desperate, he didn't want to play the wise man game anymore. He wanted truth. And there, coming before him, was Daniel to give it to him. Daniel could hear God's word, was given God's word, because he had already given up his dreams for life. He exchanged them for whatever God had for him, what his life was for, how it was defined, whatever... And during this crisis, Daniel began to realize just how big God's dreams for him were as he stood alone before a superpower and explained its place in the history of the world and saved all the wise men of his generation and all their learning and all their science from destruction. Who is this God of Daniel that he can do such things? This was the first time that was going to be asked, but not the last. The question I leave with us is, um, am I ready for this? Am I ready for God's word? When I, where did I come from? What am I? Where am I going? All your life you have heard the best answers of today's wise men. Are you at a point where you need more than that? 
more than political haranguing, more than economic projections, more than psychological categories or evolutionary charts, or talk about stardust. However accurate all that may be or may become with more study and more proper models, do you need more than any of that will ever be able to give you? Are you ready for God's word? If so, then know this. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. In that very selective stream of history called redemptive history, culminating in Jesus Christ, God will tell you where you came from and what you are and where you are going or where you could go. Please consider that you are meant to be part of something much larger than you have ever dreamed about. Listen to Daniel. Let him speak. And see if you can hear Daniel's God. Let's pray. Father, there are at least some of us here, I know, who can identify with Nebuchadnezzar. The heavens declared your glory, but we were blind to you. The morning stars sang for joy, the oceans roared, the trees clapped their hands for you, but we were deaf to it all. Far too busy worrying over our schemes and our toys. But just when we thought our nightmares would consume us, Daniel came in to speak. Daniel, or someone like him, or your printed word, or an author to explain it. You told us things about ourselves that only you could know. And you offered us a place in your unscrolling scroll of history. Thank you for sending out your light amidst all this darkness to find us. Father, we would ask you now, would you help us to take Daniel's place amidst the wise men of our age? We thank you for their hard work. But Father, give us a voice for truths they can never know, truths that no one could ever know, except that you speak them through Jesus. Amen.